I'd like to welcome everyone to Sales Results Webinar, the Executive Briefing, The Art of Selling Without Selling. Uh, for those of you who are meeting me for the first time or hearing me for the first time, my name is Steve Fretzen. Uh, I see some familiar faces on the call, which is exciting. Um, so I just uh, want to make sure we have kind of a clear channel. Uh, everybody, if you could please hit star six, if you haven't. Okay. Great. Great, great, great. Um, please, and just so you know, during the program, we're also going to have the um, Q&A section up. So if you have a question, you can either type out a question, you could star six, and you could ask a question. Um, all of those are available to you um, as we go along here. Um, so Bill Clayton saying, hello, Steve. We hear you loud and clear. I'm glad. That's good stuff. Good to see you, Bill, or good to hear you, Bill. Um, okay, so we're going to jump in right now with this and, um, and get started. The, um, the basic premise for this is, um, is to help everybody kind of understand why sales is so hard today and how we can make it a little less, uh, less difficult uh, through understanding some basic philosophies and process of, of what's, what's happening out in the sales world. Um, so what I want to do is go through, during the program, we're also going to have some polls, and um, those polls are uh, meant to not only keep you involved with us, but also to... Um, you know, give us some feedback about uh, where your where your head is out of some particular area in some particular areas. So, let me start off with just a, a thirty second infomercial about about myself. Um, as many of you know, I'm I'm Steve Fretzen. I'm the I'm the president of Sales Results. Um, in addition to that, uh, I also run a couple other organizations. One of them is Team Discovery that does um, sales recruiting, sales and management recruiting for companies. Um, and I do the uh, Networking Monkey. Uh, we run that. Hopefully you're, you're on that and you're using that to find local networking events. And then lastly, I am the area director for um, an association called the American Club Association. We had a nice meeting this morning. Uh, and uh, it's a, a networking organization made up of multiple clubs that help people to, to network around their affinities. So, for example, I'm a golfer, and I love to golf, but I also like to do business networking. We bring the two together. Uh, we have an entrepreneurship club. We have a technology club, a sales and marketing club, sports club. There's all these different clubs, and, and of course, whatever your affinity is, you can, you can go to those clubs. If you have more, if you have questions about that, please feel free to go to chicagoaca.com, chicagoaca.com, or shoot me an email, and I'm happy to give you some in additional information about that. So let's move right along here into our program. And I've got a few questions for you. I'm going to hit this, uh, hit this poll for a second here. Why are you joining us today? All right. And the top three answers are typically these. So I just want to get your, your feeling for why are you joining us today? And I just want to let me hit this poll. Okay. So I open the poll. You just want to take a couple of seconds and, and answer the appropriate um, the way for the poll. And I really want to be able to close the poll. Okay, and the closing the poll has occurred. So um, why are you here? Uh, you're interested in improving, um, you know, through some takeaways uh, from our program, uh, improving your sales through some takeaways. You're, you heard about sales results and wanted to find out more. Uh, the webinar is free, and I like free. Uh, that's always a good one. So most of you answered that you're interested in improving your sales through some takeaways from today's program. Obviously, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, my hope is that everyone on the call will get uh, two or three good takeaways that you can use you know, today, tomorrow, uh, next week, to improve your sales. That will, uh, that will make me happy. And, of course, if... Um, if there's anything I can do for you beyond this webinar, if you want to meet uh, to talk about that, that's fine too. I'm happy to meet with anybody that wants to meet with me. So, um, with that, I'm going to move along here. And what do we? Uh, what do you all want covered today? This will be our second poll today. If you just want to let me know a little bit about what you want covered today, I'm going to open up this poll. We have a lot of different things here. I don't currently have a written marketing plan. So you want to kind of answer, what are your number one prospecting or marketing issues? Uh, my prospecting activities are all over the place. I don't really know what's working. I don't currently have, a written, uh, have written goals for myself. OK. 
Okay, the poll is closing. Okay. So another one is I have difficulty staying in control with new prospects, meaning, you know, when you're talking with a decision maker, they're kind of controlling the meeting, not you. Uh, my prospects have no sense of urgency to buy from me. Um, now, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll buy from you today or next year, you know, whenever I, whenever I get around to it. I do free consulting by providing my prospect with information and pricing. So that means you go into a meeting, you lay out all the things you can do for them, and uh, and uh, you give them a lot of information, and, uh, and and they're not really getting back very much from that. Getting to the right decision maker is always a challenge for me. I have difficulty explaining my value to prospects, to new prospects. I really know what a prospect is willing and able to invest in my services or my products, and I need to close more business. So those are a couple of things that, that people put up there um, you know, regarding some of the issues that they're having. Um, most of them revol revolved around, um, I currently don't have a plan, I don't have a system, I don't have a process. Um, let's talk a little bit about why that's happening. Why, are, why is selling so hard um, now more than ever? And, you know, the, the, the kind of the thing that we've been looking at over the last five or ten years is that sales has really changed dramatically uh, over the last 10 years in the sense that the traditional, traditional selling model that everyone that I know, probably 95% of the people that I come in contact with, are using is becoming a little bit outdated. And let me walk you through that traditional selling model, talk to you about why it doesn't work, and then we can move on to what, what our program is and what our process is so you can get some takeaways from that. Um, Essentially, what we're doing with the traditional selling model is we're finding a prospect, all right? And that prospect is where we put our market, you know, we're putting our time into marketing and prospecting. And we finally get in front of somebody that could potentially buy from us. And we typically shoot into a presentation. We want to explain our value. We want to give them pricing. We want to get, well, let's, get to the, let's get to the end of the movie. Uh, so we make a presentation and kind of give them everything they're looking for, soup to nuts, so they can understand why to buy from us. What typically happens at that point is we do a trial close, which is, so what do you think? Is this something we should get involved in? Uh, where, when do we get started? That type of thing. Um, it's our job as selling professionals to have objections, or to handle, or to, uh, when there are objections, to handle those objections. Um, obviously, we need, to, we need to make sure when somebody has a problem uh, with our price or a problem with one of our service offerings or something, that we want to, you know, handle that objection and try to overcome it so that we can eventually close, all right? So essentially what we're doing here is we're going from, uh, let me just get my pen working here. We're going from presentation to close as quickly as possible, okay? Hopefully before the ether wears off and they, they wake up out of, their, out of their, uh, their food coma or whatever they're going through. Now, the, prob the biggest problem with the traditional selling model is the buyers, okay, <laughs> meaning all of us. We all are buyers. So there's something that goes on with the buyers where, as a buyer, I'm looking for information. I'm looking for price. I'm looking for all of the details so that I can make an educated decision on what I'm going to do. And that's not wrong. But look at what happens here. A buyer will typically... Uh, lie or stall when you meet a prospect to to get some information and price. So think about this. You walk into Macy's, uh, a young man approaches you, says, hello, sir, how may I help you? And typically that person's going to, you know, that, that buyer's going to say, you know, just looking, back off. You know, I'm just, I'm just, just looking, or I just got here, or, or no thank you. And even though you may not know where to go or what to do, the fact is, is that you, don't, you need a little space. You're not ready to be approached. You want to gather your information and price. You want to look at their ties, or you want to look at their shirts, or you want to look at their, their, you know, whatever, gifts for your spouse. Either way, you want to make sure you get your information and price together. As a buyer, that's, that's the most important thing. Now, where things get a little funky is with lie number two, and this is a buyer's lie. And I don't mean these lies are, are super negative. They're just ways that buyers have figured out how to get around uh, dealing with, with uh, pushy salespeople, okay, or what we, what we perceive to be pushy salespeople. So what's actually happening here is, um, is uh, and I'll give you an example. I, um, I'm looking at uh, a roof for my home. We have to, uh, we have some mold in the attic. We have to replace the roof. 
So I call up three different vendors. I get them to come out, um, and I get pricing and information from them. Well, now I see what their prices are. I can go back and forth with them to figure out who I want to work with, who has the lowest price, can I negotiate, can I have them throw some things in, and sure enough, you know, they usually will, will, will bend over backwards and end up doing a deal for me to get it done. So what I'm doing is I'm telling all three of these vendors that I'm interested in buying from them when, in fact, you and I both know that I can only buy from one vendor. I'm not going to have two or three roofers up on my roof working together. It's going to be one vendor, okay? So the lies are told uh, more as uh, stalls or excuses or um, in order to get concessions. That's where this comes in. Now, when I make a decision to go with one of the vendors, you know, the other two vendors don't know where I went because I typically disappeared. So I have to believe that everyone on this call, at some point or another, probably more often than not, has put a proposal out there to somebody, to a prospect. And you maybe met with them one or two times, maybe three times, and you put a proposal out to them, and now you're wondering where did they go. You're calling them, you're leaving them emails, they seem to have just disappeared. Chances are is that you went in and you made a presentation and you went for the close, and I want to show you how this actually breaks down. This is how it goes. The prospect uh, lies or stalls to get you to make a presentation. They then get information and price gathered. Okay? You go in for a trial close. Additional lies are put off to stall you because they have objections, and then when you go to handle the objections, they disappear. So there's a definite correlation between the traditional selling model and the buyer model, and the fact is, is they don't work well together. And the way I think of it, these are my cartoon fists. You know, they're like two fists bumping into each other. Very adversarial. There's not a lot of, of cooperative um, magic going on here. So, um, and just, just so you know, if you're on the call, if you do me a favor and just hit star six uh, to mute yourself if you're not muted. Okay, and then if you have a question or a comment, feel free to unmute and, and ask your question. No problem at all. Okay. So here's what's going on, and which is the better model? Okay, when I, when I think about which is the better model, for sure, the buyer model is better and um, <clears throat> because the buyer has the control. As soon as that buyer picks up their information and price from you, they now have all the control. They have all the information, the price. They have all the leverage they need to negotiate. There's a lot of different options for them. And what ends up happening is we have a really hard time backing up because once we've given this information and price, and they now have the control, how do we fix that? How do we go back and, 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 and try to start over? Well, you can't. All right? they already, if, if I tell you that my price is $100,000, and there's a good reason for it, but let's just say it's $100,000, and you don't understand exactly how that's going to solve your problems or, or I don't have a good understanding of what your problems are, um, chances are you're going to hear that number, $100,000, and run for the hills. I know you will. I, I would too. So we have to have a better understanding of, of our prospects, and we also have to have a way of basically tearing this model down and it's only going to happen if we tear this model down. So as long as you're going out and making presentations and expecting the buyers to just fall all over you, you know, that was the 90s. Okay, I sold in the 90s, and I can tell you it wasn't very hard. Now we're in 2012 coming up here, and buyers are scared. They don't like to take risks. There's never been more information available to them. And you've got to, you've got to do some things differently than maybe you did, um, you know, three or four or five years ago. Uh, to get business coming in the doors. And the fact is, if you work really, really hard to get this prospect and then you blow it uh, on the sales side of not being able to close it, um, and it's not a perfect world, but I'm saying, you know, to raise your ratios, you know, that's where, where people are really getting frustrated right now. So let's take a look at how we fix this process. What are some of the things that we're working on with our clients on a daily basis uh, to help them maneuver through this very difficult situation that, that we're all kind of experiencing right now. And the first step is um, we have to change the models to ensure, um, to ensure a win-win outcome. And the only way that we're going to do that is going to be by controlling the sale and walking a buyer three buying decision. 
Okay, so the really the interesting thing, and the reason that this program is called the Art of Selling Without Selling, is because what I'm about to show you, and what you may have seen before in some shape or form, is really no selling at all. Uh, the way to sell deals now is to not sell. Uh, it's not to convince. It's not to maneuver. It's not to talk people into. Um, it's going to be much more relationship-driven, consultative, with a lot more questioning and qualifying. And the second most important thing next to closing business is being effective with your time. And this actually accomplishes both. So, so st stay with me as I go through this. The first thing is, before we go any, into any kind of sale, okay, assuming that we have a prospect, we have to have a process for developing relationship. Um, if you walk into a meeting, uh, you know, dive into it head first, and the guy says, hey, tell me what you got, tell me what you have, or let's get down to business, you haven't established any kind of relationship. Um, it's very similar to um, building a skyscraper and not putting any, any, any you know, type of, of basement in it, not putting any kind of foundation, setting any piers into the ground. It's not going to be a very stable building, and as you try to climb up it and the winds are blowing, you're going to find that that building is going to fall over fairly quickly. So relationship is the foundation for any selling opportunity. We have to ensure that we spend some time here. The keys, obviously, are building trust, finding natural affinities, and be liked and be like your prospective client. And what I mean by that is, obviously, you, you have to be likable. Um, if you come off as effusive, if you come off as obnoxious, uh, egocentric, etc., you're probably not going to be, be liked very much by the person that you're now hoping is going to you know, pay your bills. Um, the other thing is to be like your prospective client. If you're seeing that your prospective client is very introverted and shy, you have to shut down a little bit. You've got you to gotta, you gotta take it down a notch. You know, I'm very hyper, and I've got a lot of hand move, movements going and such. Well, that may not be great for someone that's a real introverted type of individual. So you have to really watch the person that you're talking to uh, to make sure that you're not coming across differently than maybe they would like you to be. Um, you just have to, you have to be aware of that. Okay. So question for everybody. How much time do you have with a prospect to make a, a good first impression? Let's open the poll here. Hold on a second. Here we go. So just, just quickly, uh, first instinct, 15 seconds, 1.5 minutes, or 15 minutes. How much time do you have? Okay. Um, we're getting 15 seconds. We're getting, no one's saying 15 minutes, so that's good because that's true. You certainly don't have 15 minutes. Okay, most people are answering 15 seconds. That is the correct answer. Um, 1.5 minutes is, is, is not a bad answer, but 15 seconds, I mean, when you meet somebody, think about it. I mean, their handshake, the way they look, the way they talk, you know, are they spitting in your face as they talk? I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen in the first 15 seconds. We're, you're already making judgments about somebody, whether or not you like them or not. So think about it in a business development setting, when you're meeting a prospective client, in addition to building trust and finding natural affinities through asking good questions and doing your research, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to sort of be like them and, and make sure that you're, you look the part. Okay, it's a big part of it. So without building the relationship, you're in trouble. Let me show you real quick. Sales process is like a set of stairs. Okay, that's a door. And relationship is the first step. So if you're starting up here and you're going to jump up here to this step, you're probably going to, you're not going to make it. You're going to fall down. Um, when you touch this step, it allows you to go to the next step. It allows you to go to the next step. I mean, this is, this is the way sales is done. Most people that I know just go in and they wing it. And I was pretty good at that in my day. I'd go in and, you know, talk the talk and, uh, you know, shoot the you-know-what with people and, and, you know, build a little rapport. And then the next thing you know, I'm into my presentation. I go through my presentation book and, explain to them how great we are and why everyone loves us, and then, you know, hey, let's, let's do some business. Um, and obviously it's changed a lot. And so if you don't have a very specific list of steps to follow that you've really internalized, I know that can make it very difficult to be effective, uh, be effective out there today. A very big part of this being effective uh, out there in the, in, in your, during your sales meetings is agenda setting. 
And you may have heard me speak about this in the past, but I, I can't I can't tell you how important this is. It is just critical. It's just critical. Um, and the reason it says let's talk turkey, and this is pretty relevant considering we just had our Thanksgiving meals, um, think about this. When you sat down for dinner and you look at that table in front of you on the screen, you see, you know, that the you know, you see that the plates and the linen and the tablecloth, I mean that that that, that table is ready to be sat down at and, and enjoyed. If the other the other option is just to take all you know, take all that away, throw a, a big bunch of food in the middle of the of the table without plates or anything and just saying, Hey everybody, go for it. Well, again, most people that I talk to are having that kind of meeting. They're going in and yeah, they've got a good service and the, the prospect has a need, but they're going into it without really having any kind of real plan. They're just going in there and, and doing whatever comes natural. And again, you might close a good amount uh doing it that way. The question is is could it be improved? So let's look at this agenda. What we're talking about here is we're talking about uh, control and accountability. Those are absolutely two important uh, aspects of sales today. Are you controlling the prospect? And are you holding the prospect accountable to follow through on the things that they say they're going to do or to take action based on what you're uncovering about their needs? Okay. If I tell you that I need water, am I going to follow through on it? Well, how thirsty am I? I'm very thirsty. Okay, I'll get some water. So we have to have some control and accountability in these meetings in order for them to be effective. So these are the agenda steps that we teach. And, again, if you've heard this before, great. If not, please take, take some notes um, because this is life-changing. For most people that sell that have never really set a proper agenda, it changes everything, and, and you'll, you'll understand why as I go through this. The first thing is agendas are always permission-based. Okay, I'm not setting an agenda and influencing someone to – um, hey, here's what we're doing today. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying something like, Bob, thank you for meeting with me. It's been great chatting with you for a couple minutes. I know how important your time is. In order to make the best use of our time while we're together today, would it be all right just to, to recap the agenda that we had established on the phone a week ago? Chances are he's going to say yes because we had established an agenda on the phone a week ago, and I asked permission, and I said in order to make the best use of our time. It's very difficult for someone to say no because they would come across moronic. So needless to say, first thing is it's permission-based. The second thing is we want to make sure that we have 45 minutes to 60 minutes of an uninterrupted time. Obviously, you can make your own adjustment to that. If you only need 15 minutes, if you need two hours, that's up to you. But you want to make sure that they agree to the amount of time that you need in order to be effective with what you're, with what you're doing. Okay. So um, that's the second. That's the really kind of the first or second first two steps there. Then we want to establish a purpose to see if there's a fit to work together. Um, they might feel like you know you might feel that they're Mr. Big Shot CEO. They're up here and you're this lowly you know business developer down here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to establish a level playing field. All right, this is where I am. This is where they are. We both put on our pants, you know, one leg at a time or whatever you want to say. That's why it's so important to get them to agree that there needs to be a fit, that it, may, it has to be a fit for both of us. And that gives you some power. And by the way, people also love the word fit. They love it. All right? There's just something about it that they go, yeah, I don't feel like I'm being sold. They truly want to know if this is something we can work on together. The next step, establishing what my expectations are. And I like to ask questions. So, and I may say, would it be all right if I ask you some tough questions? You're going, to under, you're going to understand why I asked uh, tough questions when we get to step three. So hang tight on that. But the main thing is I want to let them know my expectations are to ask questions. I also want to know what their expectations are. Bob, you know, what did you have in mind for today? What, were, what did you want to make sure we accomplished today? And he'll say, well, I want to know what your program is and I want to know what your pricing is. And I could say, you know, no problem, uh, program and pricing, those are both things we can talk about probably closer to the end of our meeting today if that's okay and he'll say sure and the last step here is outcome let's decide to move forward with a yes or end the engagement with a no and this does a couple things um, mainly what it does is it allows us to get out of the of the of the think about it and the maybes and I'll get back to you's that we typically hear we're trying to get them to commit to a yes to a move forward it may not be a closing of a sale but it's some next step 
or we want to understand if it's not a fit, maybe we should just call it a no. If it's not the right time, if it's not for them, the solution doesn't match with the problem, you like them to tell you no. Now, I know my whole career I walked away from no's. I never wanted to hear no. I didn't go up to girls at the bar because I didn't want to hear no's from them either. So, you know, hearing no is something that we all have some internal strife with. And what I would, what I would tell you is I did as well is that once I embraced the no, embrace the idea that no is a good thing, okay, it gives me my time back. It allows me to move on to someone else. Now, obviously, I like, to, I like the, the no to have some reason behind it, uh, which it will. That being said, you know, without, without, without having yeses and nos, I end up chasing after people for, you know, six months or a year because they don't want to hurt my feelings, so they keep telling me they'll think about it, they'll get back to me, I'll let you know after I speak to my boss, I'll let you know in six months, I'll call you here, I'll call you there. It's all a bunch of blow-offs. And if you don't think it is, um, you know, that's unfortunate, because the truth is, the truth hurts. They are blow-offs. And, and yes, people have to think about things sometimes, but for the most part, if they're not willing to commit to a next step, um, either you haven't done your job properly, as far as exposing the issues, or they're really just lukewarm as far as interest. So um, I personally don't have time to waste on kind of wishy-washy situations, so I'm either going to move them forward to a decision or I'm going to move them to a no. It doesn't mean I don't have a friendly relationship with them. It doesn't mean I don't leave things on good terms. I leave the door open, but it's off my plate. Okay? So the way that this actually sounds, if you put it all together, okay, is, um, Bob, I know we had set an agenda on the phone uh, a week ago, but I just wanted to ensure that we make the best use of our time. Would it be all right just to set a brief agenda for our meeting? Um, and the person says yes. Great. We have about, uh, I know we've been talking for about 15 minutes. We have about 45 minutes left. Are we still all right for that? He says yes. I say, and I just, I shut down my cell phone so we won't be interrupted. I hope that's okay. He says, sure. Bob, you know, from my point of view, the way, you know, what I'm thinking about for this meeting is really to see if there's a fit for us to work together. And in order to find that out, I'd like to ask you some questions and really get to know your business a little bit better. I just want to make sure that's okay. And he says, sure. Say, so, And I may actually ask you some tough questions because I like to de- take kind of a deep dive when I meet someone like yourself. I want to make sure that's all right as well. He says, fine. Now, he might say, well, you know, don't get too personal. I say, no, I won't step over any boundaries, I promise. Then I'd say, Bob, I'm curious to know what expectations you have for our meeting today. And he tells me. I repeat them back. And I say, you know, Bob, that all sounds great. At the end of the meeting, you know, one of a couple things should happen. We'll decide that there's a great fit. We want to move forward and take next steps. On the other hand, if if we don't feel there is a fit, then we should just say it's a no and and move on with our lives. And I hope you're okay with that. I know I am. And the person will say, that sounds great. What this actually does is this takes away – the sales hook. Because when you're meeting with someone, and I don't care if you're an attorney, if you're a sales professional in the auto industry, if you're selling life insurance, everyone is feeling like there's a hook. And as soon as you can get rid of that hook, and where they don't feel like you're there to sell them, you're there to really try to understand them you know, at a higher level, that's when things start opening up for us. Okay? So we really want to make sure that we, uh, we, we, we let them know that no is an acceptable answer. And by the way, if there's anyone on the call that, um, that uh, needs to mute themselves, please just hit star six to mute yourself so we don't hear um, your back, the background noise. Okay? Thank you very much. All right, let's move on. We're doing great. So what okay, happens okay. here is no is the second best answer that you can receive from somebody. But if you do a good agenda, what you're setting up is you're setting up the discovery process. That's really what we're setting up here. Okay? So let me ask a question here. All right. I'm going to open up another poll. What do we know about icebergs? What do we know about icebergs? Okay. Oh. Did it just open and close too quickly? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I don't know who that is. Um, but essentially, icebergs are um, about 85 to 90 percent below the surface and only about 10 to 15 percent above the surface. Okay. 
So what that means is that when we're asking questions, and you've heard terms like, hey, I've, I just did a needs analysis, or I just did some questioning. I don't charge into my presentation. I ask questions. What we have found in, in working with thousands of, 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 of producers, business professionals, okay, is that people that ask questions typically do it up here above the surface. Okay, they don't take a deep dive with it. And so they end up getting good information about someone's problems, but they don't end up getting information about what's going to actually um, get them to buy quickly. So what they're typically asking, and I recommend, is asking background questions. Okay, what are some examples of background questions? They would include, you know, uh, I saw in uh, Cranes that your business was just you know, rated in, in the, you know, top 50 largest accounting firms in Chicago. Congratulations. Um, tell me about how you grew to that size. Or, um, you know, I saw you just acquired another, another company in Spain. Tell me about that. Or, um, you know, I know that you're the CEO of the company. Um, what are some of the things that you're you know, trying to accomplish with the business in the next five years? You're trying to get whatever industry you're in or whatever you're, you're there for, asking some background questions about their business is really key. Now, the next one is surface pain. We also call them apparent reasons. And, again, they typically float somewhere around the surface right here, just below the surface. Um, these are questions like, um, with regards to your business development, uh, your, your sales, what are some of the greatest challenges, frustrations, and concerns that you have? Okay. So we're trying to get an understanding of what their issues are, and we're trying to build a list of issues so that we have something to work off of. Once we do that, we want to go to some cause questions. Why is this happening? How long is this happening? Um, is this something you've tried to fix before? What happened? And then look at where we go. This is somewhere most people never go, and that's cost and impact. And it's probably sitting right around here, okay, in this section right here, cost and impact. All right? So let's say that I uncover that my, my prospect, uh, Bob, is um, having some problems with um, closing business. And I say, Bob, you know, let me ask you this. Out of 10 prospects that you get in front of, how many do you close? And he says, you know, I usually close like two. And I say, well, let me ask you, in your industry or some of your other people that work in your, in your business, um, what's a good rate? I mean, what's a good closing rate in your business? And they say five. So the gap here between where he is and where he should be is three. And then I would say, Bob, I'm curious to know, what's an average sale for you? Right. You know, I mean, I, they have a place. And Bob says, you know, $10,000 is an average sale for me. So I could then conclude, Bob, right, that every month, if this is a monthly number, that every month you're missing out on $30,000 in new revenue because your closing rate is lower than it should be. And he says, That's, that sounds about right. Well, guess what? I'm about to do some math. That's, been, that's, that's 12 months in a year, correct? Okay. So now we're looking at um, $360,000. What's the commission on $360,000? Maybe he tells me it's hundred grand. So now we're looking at a $100,000 problem because his closing rate is lower than what the average person's is or where it should be. Now I'm curious, Bob, how many years has this been going on? He says, oh, it's been going, I used to close a lot, but in the last couple of years, maybe two or three years, it's been, it's been happening where I've only been closing two. So really, if we just take two years, that's $200,000. So I'm also curious, if this continues for the next two years, wouldn't that be another 200000 Sure. So we're really looking at, minimum, about a $400,000 problem. Bob, is that correct? Just in commissions. He says, yep, that's about right. Okay, so you probably understand where I'm going with this. If you can find the cost of a problem and then, or then drive it to an impact, and the impact question could be something like, you know, $400,000, Bob, is, is in commissions is a lot of money, you know, in the last couple of years and moving forward. Um, I'm curious to know how does that impact, you know, your, your business and you personally, your family? And then I'm going to wait for Bob to answer, and hopefully he's going to answer in a bit of a personal and emotional way. Now, what happens is when you turn people to, from kind of logical to emotional, that's when business happens because no one buys or rarely do people buy on logic, okay? They typically are going to buy on emotion, all right? 
emotion. That's where most – now, you might buy on emotion, back it up with logic, but most people just buy on emotion, and that's how sales get done. What we're really trying for is we're, I'm really trying for Bob to give me this information down here. Down here is typically what we call CRs or compelling reasons. A compelling reason for Bob would be, you know, Steve, if, if I don't turn this thing around and start making the kind of money that I'm supposed to make, you know, I'm afraid my wife might leave me because, you know, we haven't been able to keep up with our mortgage payments. I haven't been able to tell her that business has been slow and I really don't have an answer for her about how we're going to, you know, how we're going to make, make our, you know, pay our bills and, and, and you know, take care of our son's tuition at uh, Northwestern and, you know, I'm at the end of my rope. I feel like I'm drowning in quicksand. I feel like, you know, my world's crumbling around me. All right, now, I'm not suggesting that the tissue box is going to come out on every call. But what I'm suggesting is, is that if you can find how a problem in a company or a problem in a situation affects the individual you're talking to on a personal level, uh, remember, people make decisions, not companies. Um, if that person can, can see how much the, the problem is costing them, and how it's impacting them on a, and compelling them to do something different, the chances of them making a decision are going to be that much higher. So instead of closing 50% that you might close, maybe you're going to go up to 70 or 80%, 90%. Okay. So there's some, there's some stuff going on here. I just uh, wrote all over what I was doing here. Hold on a second. So you can see background questions, apparent reasons. Okay, we're moving down to the compelling reasons. And that's where we find pain, fear, and gain. These are the motivators for somebody to do business with you. Okay? Pain is the strongest, fear is second, and gain is the, is the third. And I'll give you an example real quickly. Um, I've been smoking, so let's say I've been, I don't smoke, but let's say I've been smoking my, you know, since I'm in my 20s. I'm now 41, okay? So I go to the doctor, and the doctor says to me, you know, Steve, we just did the, uh, you know, we did the, 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 the EKG, we did the this, the that, and all these tests. And based on our, our information, you have six months to live. If you don't stop smoking right now, I can guarantee you that you're going you're gonna to be dead in six months. Now, I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about my son that isn't going to get to see his daddy, you know, when he's, when he's you, know, in, you know, after six months. How am I going to, my family, what's going to happen to my family? At that point, how important are cigarettes to me? thinking about all the things that are truly important. What am I willing to, to risk in order to get my life together, in order to stop, you know, stop the death that's happening? So that's pain. That's true pain. I mean, nothing hurts more than, than the loss of a family or knowing that you're going to leave your family behind. Now, the second appointment I go on, let's say that, erase that one from your, from your mind. I go to the doctor, and he does all these tests. And he says, you know, Steve, looking at your lungs and looking at everything, you know, you're really taking away from your life. You know, the smoking is really causing a lot of damage. And, you know, if you continue for the next 10 years, I could see a total breakdown in what, you know, in, in, in your ability to breathe and, and, and function. And so it's not immediate, but it's, it's there. I'm going to walk out of his office with quite a bit of fear about what he said, a lot of fear about what, you know, I better, I'm going to seriously consider getting rid of these cigarettes because, you know, he really put the fear of God into me, literally, um, based on what his, his, his tests showed, okay, and the questions he asked me. And then gain is just, you know, hey, I want to live healthier, so I'm going to throw the cigarettes away and I'm going to try to live a healthier life because that's the right thing to do for me or for my family or to live just to be healthier and happier. Any three of those are relevant to what you're trying to accomplish in a sales call. If you don't have pain, fear, or gain, it's very difficult to get anyone to move off the dime, okay? Very hard to get commitment from people. Okay, let me show you one thing before we move on. This is called the urgency meter. Okay, between 1 and 100. Okay, so I meet a prospect, Bob, at 30. Okay, meaning that at a 1, he has no interest in working with sales results or with Steve Fretzen. He's He doesn't even know I exist. So let's say that I meet him through networking, okay, and I talk to him a little bit, and sure enough, he tells me he's got a couple of issues He's not closing enough. He's not prospecting enough or in the right places. So I decide, we decide we're going to meet, and this is our first meeting, okay? In that meeting, I set some relationship, I set an agenda, and I get some apparent reasons, and I drive them to compelling reasons, okay? Meaning I find out what his personal and emotional reasons are 
to hire me to work with him. So now he's at a 90, okay? The difference between 90 and 100 is probably going to be my presentation, okay? Meaning that he's already bought in that I understand his issues, that I'm the right person to help him, that, that there's enough urgency based on what I've uncovered in, a, in an hour's meeting that this person needs to take action. They can't just go back and keep doing things the way that they've been going. That's not getting them where they need to go. They're just doing the same is not an option. That's something we both agreed to. So all I need to do is find out what does he need to see here experience, and that gets me from a 90 to 100 in most cases. Okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm suggesting that if you're, if you're leaving meetings pretty much where you started, maybe you go from a 30 to a 50, okay, there's still a 50-point gap here of no urgency. So you wonder, why are they not buying from me? Why, are, why am I, you know, they, I, put, I sent out the perfect proposal. It showed exactly how we were going to solve their problems. They loved it. After the meeting, we high-fived, okay? They might be enthusiastic about it, but that doesn't mean there's urgency to solve it. And that's really what we want to do here. So once I've gotten someone to about a 90, okay, on the urgency meter, I'm going to take them through the commitment step, which is step number four, okay? And just for, I know that we, we wrap this thing up about one, so I'm going to really kind of cruise through the rest of these steps here. Two important questions that you want to write down to ask. Once you've achieved a level of 90, I can tell you I wouldn't necessarily ask these questions unless I knew that they were going to say yes and that they were going to move forward with me. Number one is, is this a could, should, or must fix situation? So obviously if I've got someone here at a 50 who's thinking, you know, I like Steve and this, this sounds pretty good, um, I would never ask this question because I don't have any basis for this to be a must fix. They haven't opened up to me. They haven't shared their personal emotional reasons to hire me. There's been nothing that would, that would suggest this is a must fix. I would not say that. Now, on the other side of it, when I do get people opening up to me and giving me emotional personal reasons to work together, Sure enough, I am going to ask this question. In most cases, 99 out of 100, they're going to say it's a must fix. Now, when they tell me it's not a must fix, I have the ability to come back to them and say, well, 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 okay, I guess I'm a bit confused. Here you told me A, B, and C reasons why you need to do something that's incredibly urgent, but yet you're not, you're not committed to that. Well, I guess I'm just curious to why, as to why that is. And now is when the lies come out. Now is when the, the truth comes out about it. another decision maker. Another uh, something comes out about the fact that they you know there's no money in the in the in the you know the ability to pay you. Whatever the case might be, asking these questions either drives them to a decision or it moves them to a no quickly. Again, in the first meeting, in some cases. The other question I ask is, would you like my help to fix it? So if they tell me that this is a must fix, great. That's fixing the problem. Now bring me into the picture. Do you want my help to fix it? Okay. So that's, again, where you want to try to get some very positive verbal cues to keep moving along. Okay, now we have to move to decision maker. Now, obviously, my job is to meet with the decision maker every time. That being said, I think that Bob is the decision maker. Uh, he told me he's the decision maker, or I just assumed he's the decision maker. There's a problem with that. Bob has a partner. Bob reports to a board. Bob has a mentor. Bob has a spouse. There's a number of different people that can, that can poke their head into the situation and confuse it um, because Bob, even though he may be one of the decision makers, he may not be the only decision maker. So once I find out <coughs> excuse me, that there's a high level of commitment to fix, I would then ask, Bob, other than yourself, who would be involved in making the decision to move forward on this? And Bob is going to say, oh, it's just me. Now watch what I do here. Okay, Bob, I get that. Take me through the process that you're going to go through to make a decision like this. Bob's going to say, well, the first thing I do is I need to get your proposal. Then I'm going to run it, run it, out, run it to our board and see what they have to think. Okay, so what just happened there? I asked it one way, and Bob said, nope, it's just me. I asked it another way, and sure enough, there's a board. What's the problem with the board? Okay, the problem with the board is the board doesn't know me. The board doesn't know Bob's problems. The board doesn't know what's personal, emotional to move forward. What's the board going to look at? 
bottom line. Yeah. They're going to look at the bottom line. They're going to look at the money. They don't get the value. They don't know how it supports the, the, the problems in the organization. They just look at the last page. And just as a, as a testament to this, I got a proposal, I don't know, like 40-page proposal from a, from a website company a couple of years ago. I didn't read 40 pages. In fact, I didn't read two pages. I read one page, and it was the last page. And it was a number that was so huge that I threw it in the garbage, and I never called the guy back. Okay? So you really have to be careful about what you're putting out there and who you're putting it out there to. So you have to do your best to try to get a meeting with the board, okay? Because guess what? The board doesn't, isn't going to go with it most times unless you have a relationship with them or some ability to, to, to communicate with them in, in your value. So another question here is what, what's the time frame to have the results in place, okay? So a number of different questions that relate directly to decision maker I think that are very important questions, okay? Um, Second here. Okay. All right, moving forward, we're now going to one of the last steps is financial. So we know that somebody has problems that we can fix. We know that they're committed to fixing them. We know that they are the decision maker or they've gotten us in front of the decision maker. Now what's the problem? Do they have the money? And are they willing to invest it? So meet the two brothers, willing and able. Okay. Are they willing to invest the money, and are they able to invest the money in your solution? Okay. Are they willing and able to move forward? What's their budget? Okay. What happens if you come in too high or too low? So there's a number of things happening here. I come in at 100,000. Their budget's 50. Why aren't they calling me back? I can't believe it. 100,000 dollars. They should just say yes. Okay. There's a reason they're not calling me back. I didn't do a very good job of qualifying their budget. I didn't do a very good job of understanding what are they willing and able to invest to hire me. And so there's, got, there's some things that we do in the financial step to uncover that. It also helps, by the way, if you remember back to the, the discovery step with Bob that I uncovered $400,000 in commissions, right, that he didn't have from the last two years and the two years moving forward. And I could bring this back here and say, you know, we uncovered, Bob, about $400,000 in commissions that you're not getting because of your inability to close at a high level. I'm curious to know, what are you willing and able to invest to fix, let's say, a $400,000 problem? Bob says, I don't know. And I could say something like, I mean, would you 10%, 40000 I mean, is that a fair number if I pushed 40000 to one side of the table and you, if, if you, you know, were able to get 400000 from that? Is that a fair deal? So whatever the case might be, you need to come up with, with the language that's comfortable for you. But the point is is that you need to come up with a budget because if you come in at 100 and their budget is 50 uh, or, you know, or, or even worse, you, know, you could really find yourself in trouble. So you really want to be careful about that. Okay? And it happens more than we'd like to, to say. I say last resort, give them a range. You know, sometimes I'll say, you know, for, for – for the things that we're talking about, Bob, I'd say we're somewhere between, you know, ten and twenty thousand. In some cases, we've seen you know programs as high as you know thirty and forty thousand. I'm, I, I guess I'm wondering which is more within the lines of of your budget. Now, I thought ten to twenty was where he would come in, and sure enough, he says, Steve, ten to twenty is much. You know, that's really more in, in line. Thirty to forty, I just I know I'm not going to be able to do that. By the way, I'm okay with ten to twenty because that's what I had in mind in the first place. Okay, the 30 to 40 just took, took them off the scent, the dogs off the scent. What if he says, I've got about two grand, and I know that two grand isn't going to cut it? That's when I can say, you know, Bob, I, I, you know, $2,000 probably isn't going to be, you know, workable. Um, our programs typically range between 10 and 20, as I mentioned. So, you know, I, I think we need to talk about, you know, how we can maybe come up with more money, or maybe it's just not the right time. This is where I might move someone to a no. Quite frankly, if if my program is 20 and they have two, okay, or whatever the case might be, that doesn't work, right? I'm not going to say, all right, well, I'll do it for two. Meanwhile, all my other clients have paid 20. Well, that's not fair. So, and, and it, but plus, I have to keep the lights on and pay my bills and everything else. So, when when you when you have done the the previous steps effectively, watch what happens. You're in really good shape to move people forward, um, more so than if you're just kind of coming out of it out of the clear blue sky. 
so time management is key. Never sell to anyone who is not qualified. All right. If they're not qual qualifying, means they don't have a problem. They're not committed to fixing the problem they have. They're not the decision maker, and they're not financially able or willing to invest. Those are the disqualifiers. As soon as someone doesn't have those qualifiers, I address them. There's no way around them. I'm moving them to a no very quickly. Number one reason people lose sales opportunities, presenting too early. Okay, If you go back to the traditional model that I covered earlier in the, in the program, I was very clear about that. Pre presentation came in at, at step number uh, two. Okay, in our model, it's going to come in much, much later, probably step number seven. Remember, prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. Okay, say that to yourself one or two times so you understand what I'm coming, where I'm coming from here. Okay, if you walk into a doctor's office, he takes one look at you and says, hey, we're going to have to lop that arm off. You're probably going to want to get a little more diagnosis done. Okay, that prescription wasn't right for you. When you go in gangbusters presenting to a new prospect, what you're doing is you're offering up a prescription before diagnosis, and that's malpractice in sales and in medicine. Okay? Never move forward with the next step until you've completed the one before. So if we go back to that model of steps, of stairs, okay, I'm suggesting that you don't jump over steps. If I find out that, that, that this person is not qualified, I'll move them to a no here, I'll move them to a no here, but I don't jump over steps. Bad things happen when you do. Okay. The last step I have is presentation. Okay. Again, I'm selling to their pain. I'm presenting to what they need to see here or experience. I'm only covering the areas that were brought up in the discovery. I'm not overselling. Okay. And what does the prospect, again, need to see here or experience to move forward? If they need to talk to some of my clients to get some validation, great. Here's two or three clients to talk to. If they need to see my materials, great. Let's show the materials. If I show them to you and you're happy, what's our next step? And they say, oh, then, then we're ready to go. Okay. So we just want to make sure that we present to what is important to them and then establish a specific next step to ensure we don't lose them. Okay. Let's review. Stop selling. Walk a buyer through a buying decision. Okay. Really critical. It's a really critical step. Okay. Um, Prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. Okay. Remember, too, that this is hard stuff. Um, you know, in order to become an expert at something, music, athletics, anything like that, typically they say it's an average of 10,000 hours. I think if you were to add up, anyone was to add up how much time they spent invested. Now, this is an hour under your belt today, by the way. But um, if, you in, if you look at all the time you invest in your business development and trying to become a better producer, um, a more... Uh, smooth and capable uh, business developer, I have to believe it's not going to be near 10,000 hours. I mean, I don't even have 10,000 hours, and I teach this every day. So, um, you know, really, really uh, understand that it's, it's hard stuff. I mean, getting the questioning and everything else. Okay? Don't for, look for excuses to lose. Look for excuses to win. Common excuses not to work on improving your sales that I've heard. I get training internally. I do not have the money to invest in myself. I don't have the time with all my other responsibilities. Things will turn around eventually once the recession is over, hmm. and I'm not sure I'll get the return on investment I'm looking for. Um, what we find, though, is that there's a gap, okay, a gap between where people are and where they want to be. Um, what I want to do, though, is just kind of wrap this up, okay? Do you believe that you'd make more money if you regularly worked on your sales? I think everybody would answer yes to that. Okay. Would you work on your would, would you work on your sales with a sales coach if their services were free? Okay. Obviously our programs, you know, aren't free, although here's what I do have for everybody today. We have a program called V Coach, virtual coaching, and I will give everybody on this call a free month. Okay? All you have to do is go to our website, you go to thevcoach.com, write this down, the V Coach. V C O A C H dot com. Use the promo code FREEMO and you will get one free month of coaching from me. Okay? And that's going to be this bronze program right here that I just scribbled all over so you can't even read it. But what it includes is a new member orientation. We have a webinar monthly like this one, but it'll be on a different topic. 
Uh, we have monthly group office hours. This is probably where most of the value is right here. This is where you can take your toughest sales challenge and bring it to the table. And let's say it's getting to decision makers. Let's say it's cold calling. Let's say it's networking. Whatever your toughest thing is, bring it to the table. And over that hour's, hour meeting, we'll cover it. We'll give you some suggestions on how to improve. We have a guest speaker every month. Last month we had a guy that does brain training, teaches people how to train their brain. We also put out videos in the month, and we have newsletters. So it's about four hours of training, normally 95 a month. I'm giving everybody a free month here. Um, I also may have um, someone from my office give you a call in the next couple days just to see uh, how you felt about the program today and to see if there's interest in meeting with me to talk about your sales directly. Um, if so, great, I'd love to meet with you. If not, again, no problem. i um, happy to help you in other ways. If, if you're not a direct client of ours, um, you know, working together, then maybe we can, we can figure out some other ways to work together. Okay? Also, if you do me a favor, uh, go on our blog, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, whatever your favorite uh, social media is, and like us or recommend us or just be, you know, get on our Twitter and follow us, whatever it might be. Uh, we would very much appreciate that. And we're right at 1 o'clock, uh, almost at 1 o'clock. I just want to say thank you. Um, are there any questions I can answer, if anyone has any questions? Um, let's just see. Okay, Bill's making fun of my picture, that it's my high school picture. Uh, I did end a poll early. I apologize. Um, people are saying they're going to recommend me on LinkedIn, and thank you. Listen, everybody, thank you. I appreciate your time on the call. Um, and, again, if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. And um, have a great day. Thank you.